Hello, Entrepreneurship and Applied Business students. Um, we are gonna continue our reading of Fred Factor today by Mark Sanborn. And um, I am in chapter six, and today we're gonna read chapters six and seven in order to go along with week four's assignment. So uh, just as a reminder, and I'll remind you at the end of this reading, but you have two assignments every week. They are always due Fridays by 5 p.m. Uh, the first one is your Fred Factor prompt. So please read through the prompt and respond to it using complete sentences. And then number two is your choice board option for the week, which many of you are choosing to do the, uh, you know, the Shark Tank. Actually, I've had some people do the interview of entrepreneurs. It's truly up to you. Um, just make sure that you're doing something that will add value to you and your learning for this week. So back into Fred Factor. Chapter six, continually create value for others. There are two types of people who never achieve very much in their lifetimes. One is the person who won't do what he or she is told to do, and the other is the person who does no more than he or she is told to do. This is from Andrew, sorry, Andrew Carnegie. During the Middle Ages, it was believed that an alchemist, a person who practiced chemistry, philosophy, and magic, had the ability to turn basic metals into gold. Science has since proven that it's impossible to turn iron into gold, but what most people haven't discovered is that it is possible to turn the most ordinary ideas into ones of great value. Fred the Postman is a present-day alchemist, and you can learn how to become one too. A restauranter who once asked the secret of his success. Um, he said that he had benefited from working in the kitchen of a great year, sorry. A restauranter was once asked the secret to his success. He said that he had benefited from working in the kitchen of a great European restaurant. There he had learned the key to greatness was to make everything as good as it could be, regardless of whether it was complicated or a simple dish. If you serve french fries, he said, make sure they're the best french fries in the world. Fred's either create value or they add value to the work that they do. At the same time, they know that something done, whether for a customer or a colleague, that doesn't provide value could be a waste of both time and energy. Fred's complete, sorry, compete successfully by offering better ideas, products, and services than their competitors. They do more than talk about value added, they actually deliver on it. The best Freds are true artists at taking ordinary products or job responsibilities and services and making them extraordinary. They are real world alchemists who practice the art and science of value creation. Freds create value by doing more than is necessary and exceeding our expectations, most of the time for no extra pay. I once worked with a hospital that was committed to improving patient relations. One little idea made a big difference. Whenever patients or visitors asked for directions, rather than simply telling them how to get where they wanted to go, the staff member personally escorted them, especially in cases where people were confused or perplexed. Anyone who had to go to a hospital, whether as a patient or a visitor, is bound to be somewhere bewildered. Having a personal escort relieves people of extra stress that they don't need. The hospital staff provided extra value by relieving a burden. And if you'll notice, that's something that really doesn't cost anything extra. Maybe then just a few minutes of your time. A crash course of adding value. This is a small book with a big mission to help you make your life meaningful beyond anything that you've ever imagined. The following pages include some of the more important ideas that I'll share. Are you ready to learn how to be a person of incredible value to others? Here's how that occurs. Number one, tell the truth. Truth seems to be an increasingly short supply. In the marketplace, I've come used to being told what others think they want you to hear instead of what's really happening. An inquiry into delivery time gets a commitment of first thing in the morning. By the end of the following day, the package still hasn't arrived. Truth telling should be a basic rather than a value added opportunity. A philosopher once commented that if honesty did not exist, someone would invent it as the best way of getting rich. Ironically, truth is often so scarce today that we assign it an even higher value than we did in the past. Number two, practice personality power. I had just finished dining on a patio of one of my favorite Italian restaurants in Denver. My server was nice, but not exceptional. I had observed an older gentleman who was filling water glasses and chatting with patrons. As I was paying my check, he approached to see if I needed a refill. His enthusiasm was genuine as he put his hand lightly on my shoulder and said, we're glad that you came in today. Those brief words brought an extraordinary conclusion to an otherwise unexceptional dining experience. What I had felt firsthand was the power of personality. 
That happens when we extend ourselves to others genuinely and enthusiastically. This gentleman has turned filling water glasses and chatting into a fine art by injecting his own personality into the process. Number three, attract through artistry. What you are doing to add an artistic flourish to your products or service. Sorry, I should have read that with inflection. What are you doing to add artistic flourish to your products or service? It can be as simple as a unique signature or as significant as a major improvement in packaging or design. We are drawn to attractiveness, not only in people, but in goods, service, architecture, and all avenues of design. Freds pay attention to appearances, not because appearances are important um, or, sorry, are more important than substance, but because they count. Something of great value unpleasantly presented loses value. Conversely, we increase the value of things when we make them aesthetically pleasing. That's why we always talk about in our t-shirt designs is, you know, it's not so much about what we think looks pleasing, it's about what our customers think looks pleasing. And so trying to really pay attention to the aesthetics of things, because um, the look of something can totally change its value. Number four, meet needs in advance. This is the power of anticipation. Have you ever rented a car, received directions to your destination, and then promptly become lost? Wouldn't it be nice if the rental counter of somewhere had a Fred-like mentality? wrote down his or her direct dial number so that you could call them from your cell phone if you got lost. If you know that your next door neighbors are going on vacation next week, why not offer to pick up their mail or water their plants while they're gone? Often people forget about the details that need to be taken care of until the very last minute. Anticipating how you can be of service to others while your neighbors are gone is a magnanimous gesture that will create great value. Number five, add good stuff. Think of your current position. Is there anything that you could add to your teammates or your customers' experiences that would make their lives more enjoyable? Here are a few things guaranteed to add value regardless of your product, service, or work. The first is enjoyment. What can you add or what can you do to add a little enjoyment to another's day? It can be as simple as telling a good joke. Jokes stimulate smiles and laughter and give people a lift for the rest of the day. I used to carry a bag of lollipops on airplanes for kids, flight attendants, or anybody who wanted to indulge a sweet tooth. I have friends who know how to perform simple magic tricks. Sometimes they do tricks just to bring a smile to the face of another person, and sometimes they do magic to help close six-figure sales. They know the power of adding a little good stuff like enjoyment. Another one is enthusiasm. Think of enthusiasm as a blend of positive emotion and energy. This isn't a scientific or a dictionary definition, it's just how I think of it. Enthusiasm makes ordinary events, processes, services, and interactions extraordinary. Another one is humor. Laughter is, a good, is good medicine for the soul. What product or service couldn't benefit from a spoonful of soul medicine? Even if your product or service is quite serious, and receiving your mail is to most people, it's pretty serious business. You don't have to take yourself so seriously. Another area to do is subtract the bad stuff. What annoys you or irritates you the most? Wouldn't it be great if others were vigilant enough to notice those irritants and then to reduce them or eliminate them for you? That's what I mean by subtract the bad stuff. Of course, one person's bad stuff isn't necessarily bad for another person. It's important to know the stuff that you're subtracting is better gone. What constitutes bad stuff for most of us most of the time? Here is the worst of the bad stuff, waiting. No one likes to wait. While waiting can help us develop patience, most of us get far more practice than we'd prefer. Don't you love prompt people? Don't you rejoice when your appointment starts and ends on time? Isn't it refreshing to see those who serve others move with a sense of urgency, a sense of respect for your time? Freds are good at minimizing or eliminating the waiting of their customers and colleagues' experiences. Another thing we can remove is defects. It's true that nothing's perfect, that imperfection is the way of nature. But when we pay for something, we expect it to be right or correct. It's maddening to experience a flaw. A simple furniture delivery can go from excitement over the new piece of furniture to stewing over the fact that the desk is scratched on one end because of a careless delivery person. Fred strives to make their work and services defect free. Fred strives to do that. Another thing is mistakes. If defects happen to things, mistakes happen to processes. 
What a drag when someone else makes a mistake, but you have to pay for the consequences. I'm sorry, ma'am, but somebody in our office lost your application. I'll have to ask you to send it in again. One of the most powerful things anybody can do to achieve Fred's status is to do this, solve a problem that you didn't create. How's that again? Solve problems for people, even if you weren't responsible for the mistake. I'm sorry, ma'am, but someone in processing lost your application. I'd be glad to take the information by phone to minimize the time that you spend reapplying. It's no compliment to be called a problem spotter, but the world loves problem solvers. Freds take responsibility for solving problems and mistakes even if they didn't initially create them. Another thing we can remove is irritation and frustration. Can you really eliminate those two negative emotions in another person? Indirectly, it is possible to start developing positive feelings in others. I'd been getting a runaround from customer service department of an insurance company. I was so mad that I informed my principal contact that as soon as my policy expired, I would not be going into business with them again. Evidently, he didn't pass on the information when my policy expired. A woman named Teresa called me about replacing the policy, and I was incensed. Doesn't the file say that I got horrible, rotten experience and I'm done with your company? Do you have any idea how irritated and frustrated I have been while I've been doing business with your company in the past? Teresa paused for a moment and then said, I am very sorry, Mr. Sanborn. I didn't know that you had experienced this in the past, but I promise you this. I promise you this, if you stay with us, I will personally service your account and you won't be disappointed again. I did, and I wasn't. Freds work hard to minimize irritation and frustration for others and maximize positive feelings. Misinformation is another thing we can remove. Subtract as much of this stuff as you can. If you don't know the answer to a question, just say so. And if there's a reason why you don't know, at least explain why that is and what you can do to offer it in a way of accurate information. While nobody likes bad news, there is something worse, good news that isn't true. We get our hopes and expectations up and we gather information from others and then our hopes are dashed on the rocks of reality. Freds get rid of misinformation. They are honest and when they don't know the answer to a question, they will do everything in their power to find the right answer. Another thing we can do is simplify. This is another su sub, sorry suburb created value. Make it easier for people to get what they need from you. Eliminate red tape and mind-numbing bureaucracy. Don't break any laws or do anything immoral, but think about the systems that you're a part of. You know how things work. Where are their shortcuts? What does an insider that would be like you know that would benefit an outsider? If you want to be of greater service to others, use your knowledge and expertise to help them understand what appears to be a complex and overwhelming situation. If you were to call the help desk of a computer manufacturer because you were totally perplexed trying to set up your new computer, wouldn't you want to talk to a Fred? A Fred would probably begin by saying, I know how confusing this looks, but I'm going to help you and get it up and running quickly. And then he would proceed to simplify the situation. A non-Fred might range from being simply mechanical in his or her scripted responses of being downright condescending. Number eight, you can improve the situation. To improve means to make it better or to multiply existing value. Do you what you've always done, but do it better than you've ever done it. If you adopt that simple strategy, others will notice. In 1869, H.G. Hines coined a phrase that describes the goal of every Fred, to do the common thing uncommonly well. Think of an uncommon thing that you could do uncommonly well. Would an extra sentence or two in an email make a difference between simply informative and truly helpful information? What kind of style can you bring to your phone manners? Are you able to transform a phone complainer into another committed customer, not just because you addressed the problem, but because of the way that you addressed it? Freds are always looking for ways, big and small, to improve the quality of their work and their interactions. You can also surprise others. After hosting a large group of children and parents of our four Oh, sorry, of our son Hunter on his third birthday, my wife and I were exhausted. We loaded up the Explorer with grandma on board too and headed out for dinner. There was a lengthy wait at our first two restaurants of choice, so we ended up at Perkins Restaurant by default. This place epitomized ordinary. The building was old, the interior needed an update, and the menu was very basic. The only surprising thing was the service. Our server was a young woman with a cheerful demeanor. While taking our order, she noticed the adult's slumping shoulders and heard Hunter complain of his hunger. She promised to bring our food right out. 
In a few minutes, she was back with a stuffed Curious George monkey under her arm. My son loves Curious George. I just want a stuffed animal and really don't have much use for it, our server said. I thought your son might enjoy it. Hunter's face lit up as he accepted the unexpected gift. We thanked her and told her it was his birthday. Well, happy birthday, she said, and then she left to get our orders. The food was pretty good and the bill was typical, but the tip that I left was exceptional and our server deserved it. Although I don't really think that this was her ulterior motive, I think it was a thoughtful gest gesture from a nice person and it totally surprised us and lifted our spirits. Another thing you can do is entertain others. Gather round, one and all, watch and learn, yelled the young man from behind the marble table. I am the king of fudge. For the next several minutes, he narrated to us as he made a batch of fudge using a long paddle to mix and stir. The aroma was enticing and the demonstration informative, but it was the fudge king's entertainment that held our attention. If someone had asked me to go watch fudge being made, let's face it, I'd pass. But our fudge master knew something about human behavior that all Freds know. People love to be entertained. We paid closer attention, learned faster, and are, were more engaged and entertained. I'm not talking about mindless entertainment. The king of fudge had a reason for his performance. He wanted to sell more fudge. And as a result of his entertaining gestures, he did. All it takes to be an alchemist are the ordinary ingredients of the hours and minutes of each day. The worth of these minutes is determined by how you use them. Most people think creating value requires spending money, but Freds know that it's all that it takes is a little imagination. Apply the techniques and principles that you've learned in this chapter. Then, like Fred, you'll become a present day alchemist, changing the ordinary moments of your day into pure gold. I really wanna go back to those things that it said that we could remove to make things better. And I want you to think about the t-shirt shop when I just say the, the actual words, waiting. You know, nobody likes to wait for their order when it comes to the t-shirts. The quicker we can produce it, the better, right? Um, what about defects? You know, things that are wrong with the shirts. You guys informed me about the comfort colors and the fact that they stay a certain color when we heat them. That's something I didn't realize, but if we can remove that possibility from happening, we've already increased our value. What about mistakes? You know, things happen, but how can we eliminate that for our customers? How can we try to reduce that and, and profit our business as a result? Um, irritation and frustration. What types of things are irritating or frustrating to our customer base and how can we improve upon those? Misinformation. Is there any way that we can be more truthful about the information we're sharing with them? So just think about those things as we move forward and into next year with the t-shirt shop. All right, let's continue into chapter seven. Reinvent yourself regularly. The quote at the beginning of this chapter comes from our author, Mark Sanborn. A sad employee left his job of many years. Most days he worked like the day before. He wasn't disliked by colleagues, but he won't be missed. And while he made good money, he felt quite poor. He always did what he was paid to do and nothing more, and he did without having any fun. He performed his job the way he lived his life. He did it in a way that it had always been done. While not all change is good, staying the same can't be all good either. The only difference between a rut and a grave, as the old saying goes, is the depth. Freds know the one and most exciting thing about life is that we awake each day with the ability to reinvent ourselves. No matter what happened yesterday, to do today is a new day. While we can't deny the struggles and setbacks, neither should we be restrained by them. You've never been a Fred, you say. You're talking ancient history. That was yesterday. Sorry, I'm doing terrible with my inflection. I apologize. You've never been a Fred, you say. You're talking ancient history. That was yesterday. Today, you can begin the process of becoming who you want to be. If you hope to keep growing and going, all you need to do is seize the opportunity to reinvent yourself. You accomplish this by daily actions, big and small, that show your commitment to a new, improved version of yourself. Otherwise, you'll fall behind in a competitive world. Grow yourself, grow your value. The best way to grow your value is to grow yourself. Became, become a sponge for ideas. Take time to truly think about what you do and why you do it. So often we live our lives on autopilot, unable to distinguish between activity and accomplishment. The more you grow as a person, the more you'll have to share with others. Think of personal growth as the modeling clay of your reinvention. The more clay that you have, the larger and more detailed a sculpture that you can create. The more you learn, 
not abstract knowledge, but practical education, the more raw material that you'll have to shape your personal work of art. You increase in stature as you increase your mental, spiritual, and physical capabilities. As you grow, you'll make new connections with people and ideas that will enable you to become a master craftsman of value. Be led by compelling reasons. It won't help much to be driven to reinvent yourself and improve on your best. Being driven suggests an almost unhealthy compulsion to do something because you should, not because you want to. Acting out of obligation is a good way to short circuit what being a Fred is all about. My poster carrier Fred did not do exceptional, sorry, did an exceptional job because he enjoyed doing it. How could I tell? By the big smile on his face and his whole demeanor. He just acted happy. He was having fun, not complying with some work mandate. Having a goal to become more Fred-like in your work won't motivate you. Having a compelling reason, a passion, or a purpose to become more Fred-like is what will stir your motivation. Examples of compelling reasons might range from the positive effect that you'll make on others to the joy of doing an extraordinary job to being a positive role model. Whatever reason or reasons that you identify, let them draw the best out of you. Capitalize on your life experiences. In your life, you've likely seen and experienced phenomenal things. And while you haven't exactly forgotten these things, you probably don't often bring them into your conscious awareness and use them productively. If you wanna reinvent yourself and improve for the future, spend some time reflecting on the past. What are the most important lessons that you've learned? What, what did you once deeply desire to accomplish that you never actually attempted? Which people most shaped your life and what did you learn from them? Whom do you admire the most? Which of the skills and characteristics would you like to develop in your own life? Buy a small journal, jot down some answers to those questions, and also write down what you remember or learn each day. Capture and capitalize on the ideas that too often stay hidden in the rich storehouse of your mind. You can also increase your IQ. It isn't enough just to have good ideas if you don't do something with them. Your ability to be a Fred depends on your IQ. Now don't be discouraged if you're not an Einstein or a, brain, um, or a brainy person. By IQ, what I mean is your implementation quotient. So not intelligence, implementation quotient. In the case of IQ, um, in this case, IQ represents the difference between having a good idea and implementing it. I think a lot of times we have good ideas, but we don't actually put them into action. How many good ideas die for lack of action and follow through on your part? Knowing that you can make someone's day and actually making his or her day are two dramatically different things. One way to improve your IQ is to write down good ideas as they come to you and then put them on your daily to-do list. Sometimes inaction is the result of poor memory and what you commit to writing is actually easier to remember to act upon. Another thing you can do is you can improve on the best. Good ideas are all around you. Seek out what the best people are doing, watch, and learn, and then adapt and apply. The last statement of this is key. If you just copy what others are capable of doing, you're only doing as well as they do. The key is to adapt, to take the ideas from every source, and then apply them with your own special flair. You can learn from other Freds of the world, people in other departments or in other organizations or in other industries, even in other countries. While the ideas that you observe may not exactly fit for you, with some tailoring, you can go beyond simply duplicating and become truly innovative. Practice the one a day plan. Good news, you don't have to do everything in an extraordinary manner. If you attempt that, you'll be bogged down before you've even left, the home in the, before you've even left home in the morning. Turning the ordinary into extraordinary happens one active at a time. So if you do just one extraordinary thing a day, whether at home or at work, seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, even while on vacation, your life will soon be a record book of the extraordinary. One extraordinary act a day isn't overwhelming. It is very doable. Dozens of acts a day, well, that's unrealistic. But one a day, anyone can do that. Start by doing what you know that you can do. As you continue reinventing yourself, supplement your one-a-day strategy by doing more. But build on that simple practice. Think about it. All it takes. One thoughtful remark to a loved one each day to enrich a relationship. One exceptional performance a day to get the right kind of attention from your boss. One unexpected act of service a day to turn a life of another person into a positive direction. Over time, 
the one a day principle will turn your mundane life into an extraordinary life and it will do the same for others as well. Compete, but with yourself. It's common to compare yourself with others. We want to know how to stack up, or we want to know how we stack up compared to those around us. Are we better or are we worse, more skilled or less skilled, faster or slower? There's nothing inherently wrong with that, but it can drive you crazy. The reality is, is that there will always be people accomplishing more or less than you. The comparison game can be rigged simply by carefully choosing from whom you measure yourself against. It's a lot more productive and fun to compare and compete against yourself. The goal is ongoing improvement. Reinvention is positive change. Benchmark where you are against how far you've come and where you want to go. Develop a baseline for your attempts to be like a Fred. Keep track, but don't keep, store, don't keep score of those ordinary things that you attempt to make extraordinary as well as the results that they create. Continually look for ways to take your game to the next level. Don't forget about the ripple effect. I had just finished speaking to a group at the 50 yard line of Atlanta, Georgia's dome. IBM, the host of the special event, had rented the facility. The participants, a group of 100 highly creative web designers, seemed to enjoy my speech. After I had finished talking with a few audience members, a man near the field entrance approached me. He extended his hand and said, I'm one of the bus drivers. They didn't really invite us to attend your presentation, but I stood in the back anyway. I like hearing speakers and learned new things. I want, to, I want you to know that you are really encouraging to me. You see, I'm an inventor. I've invented a new seat cushion that people can use while attending events and stadiums just like this one. And I agreed with practically everything that you said. Your words have encouraged me to keep trying. The host company was very happy with my presentation that day, but the biggest reward came not from that or from the fee that I received, but from the feedback of an appreciative individual who wasn't even supposed to be in the audience. It is possible that you are making significant impressions on others and you don't even know it. We need to be conscious not only of the primary effects of things that we do, but the secondary consequences, which are ripple effects that touch far more people than those in our immediate presence. You just never know who's watching and listening. Our lives, to paraphrase um, Shakespeare, is a play out on a stage. Freds find satisfaction in their passion for significance. They distinguish themselves not by the results that they've achieved, but by how they've affected and touched others. Bob Briner, former president of ProServe and the author of several books, distinguished himself by living a life of service. His trademark was to ask clients, friends, and colleagues how he could serve them. It wasn't a hollow question. He really worked hard to serve others. Just days before Bob succumbed to cancer, musician Michael W. Smith went to see him. Despite being weak and frail, Bob managed to ask his visitor one last question. How can I serve you? Bob Briner was a Fred. Whether they are formal leaders, entrepreneurs, employees, family members, or friends, Freds have a profound impact on others because of the example that they set. Their efforts inspire both directly and indirectly. That's one of the best reasons I know for continually seeking to reinvent ourselves. And that brings us to the end of chapter seven. For your assignments this week, don't forget to do your Fred prompt. So please read the prompt after listening to this video and, and hearing all that came from chapters six and seven and respond using complete sentences. And then also don't forget to do your choice board option. If you have any questions along the way, you can always email me or you may also call or text me using my Google voice number. Have a great day.